there is a Buddhist notion that uh, life is like a waterfall. So we we start out all pooled together uh, as one great cosmic soul, and then you 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 go through life as an individual, and then you return to the common pool at the end of your life. Uh, I love all this stuff. It's pretty, um, but I do make a distinction between poetry and and science, and I and I do both. I just proved it. I did the limerick. But the point is, for me, I'm much more interested in take finding poetry in science than in than in starting with my poetry and then finding some science to back it up. And I have I have I I know lots of people who do either thing i just decided so you could say it's my i've got my analysis and my advocacy i'm way more interested in my analysis informing my advocacy i do not want my advocacy informing my analysis i think there is value in a synergy it's mutually beneficial if philosophers push the limits of what can be hypothesized and then science as the role of like proving or disproving but that's what can also feed new hypotheses so it, it's like a um, it's like a chain well that's that's very central to my work so i would not there's a i think it's a misunderstanding that we assume that science just does testing obviously your point so i really think that natural philosophy was a much better term for it It's trying to find natural explanations for all natural phenomena. That's what I think science is really about. And at least half of it is coming up with priority hypotheses to test. Um, and them being testable is crucial because if you have a philosophy that can't be tested or can't be proven wrong, you know, it's not really a hypothesis. It may be a comfort, like it's all, you know, it, uh, it's all God's plan. Uh, that can't be tested. That is, there's no way to test against otherwise, or the universe trying to teach us something or any of that. That stuff can be great comfort, great poetry, but but still, to your point, they need each other. And not only that, scientists, whether they admit it or not, have to engage in philo in philosophy. It's a different form of philosophy, but it's it's an important one. And and actually, I I'm arguing these days, I've got an article coming out in, believe it or not, Russian. Um And, th and then in the U.S. it'll come out soon, too, about a, an interesting thing. I think there's been two scientific revolutions, and there's one still to come. The first one was, was the philosophical one. It was bringing rigor to formalism. And this started way back. It's when logic and mathematics became crucial. It's essential to generating good hypotheses. The second one is the one everybody knows. This is Francis Bacon. This is Newton. It's the Enlightenment. It's bringing... Um, bringing rigor to empiricism. Now, those two categories actually have formal names in logic. The first one is called deduction, and the second one is called induction. But there is a third one in logic, and it's the one that everybody kind of sweeps under the rug. It's called abduction, and it's basically categorizing things. So how do we, how do we bring rigor to categorization? Because right now, I mean, there's a bunch of different philosophers and scientists who are working with categories that they know really only by intuition. They don't know what they, 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 they assume a category. An example would be, I would do a lot of work in, in the social sciences, in psychology, where the biggest currency of all is motivation. Well, I've been to top level conferences of psychologists And I'll ask them what a motivation is, and they can tell you what it does, but they can't tell you what it is. So they know that there's a, they know it by its consequences. If they see some effort, then they assume a motivation. And they assume it happens in bodies and that it, that it happens in, it's instantiated in molecules and chemicals and all of that, but they know that molecules and chemicals don't have motivations. So motivation is really, you could say, it's what, what, what initiates trying. So you got, here you got this category that everybody is totally relying on. And they're making all these models where there's this motivation generating this effect, this effort, which causes this effect. But they don't actually know what the category itself is. So, um, and, and some will acknowledge that they don't know it, and some won't. Um, Uh, they'll say that they don't need to know what it is, that it's just kind of assumed and it, it, with life there's motivation. So I'm interested in particular in how you bring rigor to categorization. 
This is interesting. I might be going a little bit off track here, but this reminds me of music because the more musician I talk to, everyone says you need to feel music. They know the rules, like they, they know how a melody works, how harmony yeah. works. But as soon as we talk about composition, they go like, you need to feel the music. And the most widely accepted theory is that a machine would never be able to compose music as a human would because they cannot feel. And I argue that that's not really the case. The problem is labeling things. We know what works and what not, like what pattern of notes and the yes, duration yes, or whatever. Yes. So machines would be much better that job because they would do it with well, yeah, rigor. So yeah, so there's a there's a professor about an uh, hour and a half from here at UC Santa Cruz, who has basically figured out the DNA of Bach, <laughs> and generated through computers. Um, Bach compositions that Bach experts cannot distinguish from Bach. Now, I'm not saying that it's it, it, that is it generates the notation that is then played by musicians. I'm a musician too. I did do classical music for a while, but these days it's all I I I'm a bass player, a singer in funk, soul, world, uh, mostly jazz actually these days. Um, but so so it is fascinating how music works on us um, emotionally. Yes. I do have a sense of it coming out of this work with the neuroscientists um, because we have a theory about what's going on with emotions um, that relates to hemodynamics. That is the supply and demand for blood in different parts of the brain. And when there's a shortage, there's when there's a, in effect a pull where more is more is needed than f to metabolize something than there is. So, there, I, I think of music as a kind of fluid dynamics or calligraphy. Um, that's that's what I'm trying to achieve in my music. And so I get to play with all sorts of people. And there are musicians who are quite skilled. Uh, you know, they scribble within the lines just really well. But I wouldn't want to tongue kiss them because they don't really have the sensuality that I'm after. And I'm talking about a beefy, repulsive guys who I wouldn't want to tug kiss anyway. I'm, t I'm speaking figuratively is what yeah, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but there are others who, who really seem to get the calligraphy or the fluid dynamics of it, and there would be a relationship there. But why a minor chord sounds different from a major one, I have a vague sense of it out of the understanding of the the uh, the harmonic series. But no, I and some of it's also cultural, of course. Um, you know, uh, yeah, so I, in this very room every Sunday, I get together with two Nigerian musicians, fabulous players. One of them toured with Stevie Wonder. We we play the funk, and we have different and and he sings, and no, it wouldn't count as the same kind of singing as ours. So that's a cultural influence on it. Um, yeah, but but yeah, there's certainly there's certainly a plenty of mysteries left to resolve. And in a way, my point is. Um, we got to get better at flagging what we don't know um, and are still working out a, a theory for. And one of the key ones is trying. I mean, we're pitching one of the, the, the most direct and first theories of what trying is from chemistry. Because basically the way I think about categorization, and this actually applies already to also to the asshole work. I'm, I'm, I'm a remembering, uh, I'm, I'm reinstating something that's kind of assumed but not remembered in the sciences, which is that the prior sciences have to explain what the later sciences assume. So trying is something we assume in the life and social sciences. It's not something that you can't even talk about trying in physics and chemistry. You can't say the moon pulls on the tides in order to achieve some effect. No, that doesn't, you'd be considered insane. So you've got to start, and you can't, so, so we don't have an explanation for trying. And so, you, you, you know, if you were at a university and, the, and they said the moon pulled on the tide, you think it's crazy. And down the hall, they say, uh, this organism does this in order to achieve something. We have to admit, we haven't explained this major gap in our understanding. What is trying and how did it start? And it would have to start from chemistry. And, any, and everything, and, and in philosophy, you end up with a lot of people who are just giving these, they're basically working as a kind of taxonomy. They label categories and they manipulate them into descriptive models, and they haven't got an explanation for the origins of something. 
So for example, the whole free will debate is, is dancing around the question of what is will? The determinists say, there's no will, you're just a chemical, you're just chemical cause and effect. The other guys say, and, and but even by saying you are just chemical, what is you then? If exactly. you know, okay. And the, and the free will people say, uh, no, obviously there's will. And the question is whether it's completely independent of, 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 of any kind of external um, uh, constraints and could do whatever or something like that. Obviously there's lots of variations, but they aren't getting around to the question of will. What is will? What is trying? The will to live is where you'd start for that, and from chemistry. It, it reminds me of, are you, are you familiar with um, dual aspect monism? Yes, yes. Uh, it, which is, which is, so this is, there's, there's a few camps, and that one's a, one of the fudgiest. I mean, geez, yes. you know, you, so you got, you got the eliminativists who say, um, there's no difference. There is no trying, is basic. So what we're talking about, we're talking about, I would say, four features that are distinctive of living systems. You got selves, and they engage in functional fitted effort. Function is better and worse. It's good for, bad for, useful, function. That's what function is. Fitted means it's got to be with respect to a certain environment, the environment with, with which you're, you're operating. So fitted would be adapted or responsive to the circumstances. And it's effort, not just work. It's effort. Okay, so those are the four qualities. And so someone can, so the eliminative is say, none of them are real. Those are all epiphenomena. They'll say they're a figment to which we say, a figment to whom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, they're also saying, uh, choose determinism. Which is a paradox. Choose determinism. Okay. And then you got then you got the panpsychists. The panpsychists say, well, everything has a kind of functional fitted effort. Um, you know, it, everything is trying in a way. The molecules are trying, quantum particles are trying, everything's sort of trying. There's a little bit of psyche in everything. And I and I know high-level people who think this. One of my favorites is the Vatican's chief astronomer. And he'll and he told me, no, this table is this table is responsive. You tap this table and it responds. So that's a kind of panpsychism. There's a little bit of God in everything. Um, or a little bit of a little bit of psyche in everything. Then you've got the dual aspect monads, monists. Basically, they want it both ways. They, you know, if it's dual aspect, you don't need to give it two names. Um, you know, if you talk about the mind and the the mind mind slash brain, you're just basically equivocating. You're just dancing around the topic. Um, I, I mean, I understand why they would do it, and it's, it's, they can engineer all sorts of interesting things by doing that, but it's not a, it's not a great answer. And then there's, a, there's another category, which are the Mysterians, um, and they say, well, it's not knowable, or I'm simply going to name something that is the source of it. Um, whether it be I could give it a spiritual name like vital force or soul or God or something like that. Or I could give it a more technical sounding name, but naming is not explaining. Exactly. So I'm of a camp that is the emergentist. And we're saying, no, the burden is on us to explain how this new phenomena comes out of uh, the old phenomena. That is trying is something different from nothing but chemistry. How, how did that come about? What, how how does that work? And our answer is, it's not something added. It is a it's a constraint on what happens. It's I'm a, a limitation on my self control. I like the battery analogy. Basically, we're an accumulation of energy that it's doomed to fade away. Like it's just a process passing through. That has its advantages, but I want to say no. We're not just we're not just <laughs> energy, and we're not just a battery. We're actually but a battery. You you can do something with this model though. You're, you're a circuit. If you think about it as a circuit, which is channeling energy. So a battery is battery by itself is not, I mean, a battery that just peters out is doing no work. Uh, you know, if you leave a battery and it, over time, the inequality that is the energy in it will dissipate, but that's not doing any work. We make effort and that's like a circuit and a circuit basically, um, an electrical engineer is a constraint wrangler. They're, that is, they're running stuff through to get the work they want and not the work they don't want. But so, so I am not, I'm not my energy. 
I'm, you know, I'm not my breakfast. I'm how I channel that energy into work to regenerate my ability to channel energy. And so, so I am, and this is different from a circuit. A circuit is doing nothing to regenerate itself. Exactly. But this is the main difference between us. I have to, their work is doing other things. A circuit does other things. It, you know, it turns a fan or something. Very useful to me. But I have to, the work that I'm doing is to regenerate my ability to do work. And the ability to do work is to channel energy. You channel energy. So I am a constraint that channels energy into regenerating that constraint that I am.